Director of Public Prosecutions. We have this show every Friday at 8 a.m. Of course, sometimes you're late because of technical issues, but always on at 8 a.m. So feel free to tune in every Friday for us. Uh, this show is meant to inform and educate you. Above all, we, ex we want you to learn so much about the law so that you can know how to apply it in your daily lives. We are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on YouTube. Feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Our comment section is on. There are experts standing uh, on standby to help you um, understand the law, especially the discussions we may have today or any other question you may have. Feel free to ask. They're waiting to answer all, all your questions. On Facebook, we are at ODPP Kenya. On Twitter, we are at, uh, at ODPP underscore KE. And of course, YouTube is Office of the Director of <coughs> Public Prosecutions. Please subscribe. My name is Anita Onuko, and um, I will be your host for today. So before we start our discussion, this, uh, we are going to take you on a quick roundup of the courts today, of the courts this week. Uh, I mean, what has happened in the courts? Uh, our, first, our first case will be of Jennifer Wambua, a very sad case that uh, took place last week. Remember, her body was found in Gong Forest. Jennifer was a prosecution witness in a, in a land case. So the DPP has ordered for the investigation into her death. Remember, as part of the education, this is, the, this is one of the mandates of the OGPP. So he has asked uh, the investigative uh, bodies, agencies to investigate this death, and then he can pick it up from there. The office can pick it up from there. Our next case is from Wajir. Uh, to, there are three public officials who have been, uh, who have been charged with embezzling 26 million of public money. They are meant to respond to these charges in a court, uh, I believe, in Wajir. They are charged with corruption, abuse of office, um, and amongst other things. So we are on the lookout for that case as well. You remember corruption is one of those key, one of those fights that uh, the ODPP or the DPP has taken uh, quite, uh, has put it on the forefront of everything they're doing right now. Still on corruption, uh, there's the current MCA. Remember David Beria? Her, the one who was found guilty of embezzling, or rather of taking a bribe. Remember the court uh, barred him from holding public office. Uh, the joke is that he wants to still hold public office, and he went to court to ask them to still allow him to hold public office. But again, one of the repercussions of being found guilty of corruption is that as a public officer, you will be barred from holding public office. And I guess glad to report the court upheld this, and still he can't hold public office. He's still barred from public office. And the other case we may look at today is the one in Mombasa, and this is possibly a lesson to all of us. There's a guy in Mombasa who was charged with, uh, with uh, I think, extortion. He <coughs> wanted to, to distribute uh, one of those uh, videos. You know, when you find someone in a compromising situation with, uh, I mean, and, and, and more so a public officer. So he tried to, 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 to take 200,000 from this guy so that he doesn't publish these videos. But then he was taken to court, he was found guilty. He's been charged with uh, extortion, and uh, he's been asked to pay 200,000 shillings, the same money he wanted from this politician, or face one year in jail. And one of those things the judge said is that the guy was not remorseful at all. Either he had just given up to faith or something, but he wasn't remorseful. So the judge just said, this guy has to pay this money or face one year in jail. Remember the case was for the Lamu senator, Loi Tip Tip, one of those stories that came from Lamu. That's a quick sneak into the court this week. Uh, we'll give you more information. If you have a question, if you have a clarification, feel free to comment and uh, the experts are on board and on standby waiting to respond to you about anything you may want to ask. So this week we have been talking about child justice. Uh, child justice is quite one of those things that we have to understand as a country, as a people, because remember the youth are about 80% of the population of this country now. And of course, before you attain the age of, uh, of, of being a youth, you're a child. So we are going to discuss about child justice. We have taken you through some, some tenets of the law that, are part, that pertains to child justice on Twitter and on Facebook. We've seen your comments, we've seen your questions. But today uh, we are going to discuss child justice with the, with the, with the what do you call her? I call her Mama Yao because she's the mother of children, of all children in this country as, a, as pertains to the law. So uh, on air today, we are privileged to host Caroline Karimi. She is Mama Yao in all, in all ways, in all means. She holds 
uh, she's going to teach us and educate us some nuances of the law that pertains to child justice. I'll allow her some few minutes to introduce herself. She's the head of child mission <coughs> and anti-FGM, but let me not get into that. Let me allow her to introduce herself. Caroline, Karibu Sana, mm -hmm. please tell us a little bit about yourself okay. and what you do at the ODPP. Okay, thank you, Anita. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Caroline Karimi. I work for ODPP, as uh, has been mentioned, and the head of uh, the Children's Division, which also has the anti-FGM unit. So I've been a prosecutor for quite a while. Um, it's, a, it's a job that I really enjoy. Um, it has given me a chance to be able to interact with uh, a lot of people and transform their lives and do something about um, the, the challenges that they are going through, maybe something that has happened to them or just to enable them to access justice. Okay. So um, it's a noble job that I, I really thank God for this opportunity. So oh, good. I hope you don't mind us calling you Mama Yao. Next. Does it speak about <laughs> your what you do? Yeah, uh, yes, it does. In fact, some people also call me Mama Watoto. Oh, good. Yeah. Being responsible for children in this country. Yes, um, it, it's a it's a group that is very good to work with. Um, they're they're souls that have gone through so much, but they never, you know, like uh, lose their hope completely. So. I've learned a lot from the children, and they've also managed to be able to benefit so much from ODPP. Oh, yeah. Good. So what is the first case that, that introduced you to child justice? What is that one case you remember that introduced you to child justice? All right. Um, Actually, I, before that, yes. why is it not juvenile justice? I remember you correcting me. It's no longer juvenile, but child. So why is it no longer juvenile justice? Uh, oh, right. Uh, before the, the Children's Act, there was a lot of the use of the word juvenile, and it had the connotation of a child who's, you know, troublesome, a uh, who's truant in a way. Uh, but when the, the Children Act came into being, you will notice that they did away with anything juvenile. So the entire act does not have the yeah, word juvenile. juvenile. They moved to use the word child because it was more representative, because the truth of the matter is that it's it's not that we only have children who have committed offenses in the in the in the criminal justice system. We have others who are into the system because of something that has happened to them. They are victims or uh, witnesses of crimes. Mm. But also, international conventions have encouraged governments to move away from using the word juvenile. juvenile. Okay. Yes. Oh, interesting. So, what is that one case that, when you think about, is what introduced you to child justice? All right. Uh, honestly, I can't even remember my my first maiden case, mm -hmm. uh, but there are cases that stand out that really, you know, drew my attention to the plight that children are going through. And one of them was um, a very sad case of a brother who set his sister on fire. Um, and what was unique about that case was that we, we as prosecution, you know, stopped for a minute and we asked ourselves questions like, what would make an 11-year-old boy who clearly still loved his stepsister mm -hmm. set her on fire? And we went uh, ahead and did uh, like social background inquiries yeah. into the life of this boy to try and understand why he would do such as, uh, you know, a horrible thing horrible, yeah. to a, a small child because the sister was around three, four years. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered is there were a lot of issues going on at home. There was uh, a stepfather in the picture. There was a lot of abuse towards this boy. Uh, there was a lot of neglect and the mother seemed to have taken a certain side. Mm. So the boy had developed a lot of anger and, and pain out of it, uh, which had been suppressed over time. And that is one of the push factors that made him do it. He did it not because he wanted to punish the sister, but he thought she was a coveted item that had come into their life and that out of it he had been pushed aside. Mm. And we also did some mental assessment of the boy. And what we got back was some recommendations from the psychologist saying, this is not a child that you need to put through the criminal trial system. Mm. You need to find alternative ways mm. of dealing with it because there were underlying factors to uh, what that he had done. Mm. Yeah. So mm. and, and that opened my mind to the fact that when you're dealing with a child, 
before you put them through the criminal justice system, you need to understand. Children are supposed to be innocent. Yes. So what is it that is causing these children to come into the criminal justice system? So you're also shrinks in, some, in, in another world. We have learned a lot from... <laughs> from having those reports mm. and reading a lot about children and how their world is really intertwined, their education, their social, their, yeah. their, their, <clears throat> their ecology, mm. everything is just one big ball. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe just, again, just taking you back to the, to the mandate, what's, a, what's your mandate as a head of child division? What's the mandate of the ODPP in child justice? Mm. And of course you spoke about international conventions, I mean, how do those, uh, how do they play within our own uh, national space? Okay. So the, the ODPP is a big organization. It's um, the only institution constitutionally that has the mandate to do criminal matters. And it has four departments with it. My division falls under the Department of Conventional and Related Crimes. So we are a specialized unit. Our work is to deal specifically with children matters. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things we do, of course, is to prosecute uh, cases involving children. Mm -hmm. And here we are talking about either a child who's been uh, charged with a criminal offense mm -hmm. or an adult who's committed an offense against a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then you look at the laws and uh, you know, propose reforms to any law which mm -hmm. we think is retrogressive or give suggestions of progressive ways of dealing with children, a reviewing of cases, and just a any other aspect. But it is mainly, we, we focus on the child. Okay. Yeah. So who's a child? Who's a child? How do you define a child? Or how does the law define who a child is? All right. <clears throat> so the law defines a child as any person who's under the age of 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, that is the legal definition of a child. Um, but let me also add that there is a reason why there's the age 18. Like, why did the law decide yeah. 18 yeah. and not 16 or and not 21? Mm -hmm. uh, there is some biological and scientific um, uh, 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 explanation to it. Yeah. So, um, in most countries, it's 18 mm -hmm. because um, uh, research has said and science says that the age of 18 is when somebody has reached a certain level of maturity yeah. where they are able to make rational decisions about aspects yeah, of their lives. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's, a, it's really about um, the development of the child, the maturity level, the rational, and the judgment. So anyone below the age of 18 still As a child. hasn't attained that level of maturity to get them to be an adult, so they are children. At 18, you're still a child? At 18? No, when you're 18, you're an adult. Oh, so, so anyone below the age below. of 18. Ah, okay. Yes. So 18 and above, you're considered an adult. You're considered an adult. Ah, okay. So I was reading, as I was reading about this uh, discussion today, I read about something about children in contact with the law mm -hmm. and children in conflict with the law. Because yes. I think at first when I was reading through this, I assumed this was just children, in, you know, children justice. It's just open-ended. So what's the difference between a child in contact with the law and a child in conflict with the law? And where does the ODPP stand? Okay. I mean, on what side do you stand? All right. So let me begin by giving an explanation of uh, the definitions. Yeah. <clears throat> so a child in conflict with the law is any child who's been charged with a criminal offense. Yeah. So yes, children do commit offenses. Uh, some of them very petty offenses. Yeah. They will pick money yeah. because they want to buy a sweet, still stealing, they might assault someone. Um, but they also commit very serious offenses. So we have children in the system who have been charged with murder oh, no. and robbery with violence. And some of them it's very aggravated, mm -hmm. you know, murder, robbery with violence. So that's a, a child facing a criminal charge. Mm -hmm. Right. So what's the age of what's the what's the age of criminal responsibility? I mean, is there like a limit? Like if yes. your child committing murder at a certain age, you don't charge them or I mean I think the question is, what is the age of criminal responsibility? So the age of criminal responsibility in Kenya is eight years. Ah. So if a child is eight years and below, you cannot charge them for whatever oh. offense they do. Mm. But there's also another cap, which is below the age of 12, where if we want to charge a child as ODPP, um, the law requires us to rebut a certain presumption. The presumption... Is the maribat. 
Okay, like, <laughs> so there is the presumption, yes. if a child is below the age of 12 years, they might not have known what they were mm. doing at the mm. time. Mm. So if they committed an offense, we still need to go a step further mm -hmm. and show the court that though this is a child, when they were committing the offense, they were fully aware of what they were, of doing. What they were doing and the consequence, the outcome of whatever they were doing. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So before such a child takes plea, prosecution must show the court that the child knew. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. So those are the two categories we have when mm -hmm. it comes to criminal responsibility. But above the age of 12, we, we will charge. Mm -hmm. All right. And then so there's the child in contact with the law. Mm -hmm. So we call them in contact just basically as it sounds. Mm -hmm. This is a child who's come into the system, not because they have committed any offense, but something has brought them into the system. Yeah. And one of the things that can bring a child to the system mm -hmm. is if they were a victim yeah. of the crime. Yeah. So they come into the system as a victim who needs to go to court mm -hmm. and tell the court what mm -hmm. happened the to them story. to yeah. testify. Mm -hmm. All right. And then we have others who have been neglected. A parent who is never there, the child is just loitering in the streets. Mm -hmm. The government takes this child, brings them into court mm -hmm. for the court to protect them and to give them somewhere to stay. Mm -hmm. Or the ones who refuse to go to school mm -hmm. or the ones who are pregnant, mm -hmm. you know, something is happening to them that is uh, infringing on their rights. So the, the, the government has a responsibility to this child and the way to secure that responsibility is bring the child into the system and then the system can channel them into safe places where the needs of the child can be met. Oh, okay, good. Right. At least we learn something. Like I said, we are meant to educate. So when you say rebut, <laughs> All right, yeah. we have to go back to our Google <laughs> and search and see what you meant. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So maybe something else just to bring this thing home is uh, the discussion on house girl. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think last week or the other week there was a video there was news in the news, a house girl in Don Home hacked two children because she fell out with her employer. Mm -hmm. And yet she was arrested. But I mean, when the when the story came out, everyone was tagging ODPP. Do something, do something. Mm -hmm. I mean, what 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 is the advice? I mean, again, the other question is, what is the process? So I see a house girl mishandling a child, mm -hmm. I see a house girl mistreating a child. And most of the in most cases you find a house girl is just a child herself. So children taking care of children. I mean, how does the DP come into such cases? How do we report such cases? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, it is unfortunate when things like those ones happen. Anita, I think it tugs at everybody's heart. It does. Yeah, because children are innocent mm. and uh, they don't need to be to be harmed for somebody to, you know, express to make a point. Or yeah. Make a point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, but let me begin by saying, first of all, we should not even be having house girls who are children. <laughs> but it, it is there. So, meaning it, a lot it, of people are criminals out here, right? Yes. Yeah. But they should know that there is a law and the law can be enforced. Mm -hmm. So, if there is a house girl somewhere and the house girl is a child, first of all, that's an offense that's being wrong. committed because mm -hmm. children are not supposed to, um, child labor is not allowed in Kenya. So, that's one of the offenses we have. And remember I told you who a child is. A yes. child is somebody whose rationale of judgment is not there child. yet. They're yeah. not there yet. So if you leave them in charge of the children, something is going to go wrong somewhere. And it's know? really wrong. And it's also very wrong. Mm. And then also the aspect of you now what does the Mwanainchi do when they see when a they crime see, has yes. been committed? Where do they start? Or if I see uh, there's a house girl who's being mistreated and is a child herself. Exactly. Yeah. What do you do as a neighbor? Because we all have a responsibility yes. as citizens of this country. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to make this country better for everyone, mm -hmm. we must take up our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But let me explain how, uh, how to go about it. Yeah. So the first most important thing is we need to understand which are the law enforcement offices yeah. around us? Yeah. Which are the government institutions available to Manainchi that they can go to and report something which they have noticed? Mm -hmm. It is okay even to suspect a child is being mistreated. Oh, and just report. And just suspicion. report. For example, if your neighbor's child is always crying and screaming, mm -hmm. you might not be seeing them, you may not see them being. Yeah physically abused, mm -hmm. but the crying and the screaming could be an indication that something is it's not wrong. right. Mm -hmm. You know, so even that suspicion is enough. Mm -hmm. The Children Act talks about it. If you suspect 
that a child is being abused somewhere, you can always go and report. Yeah. So the, the first best place to go and report is the police station. Mm -hmm. So Mananchi needs to understand which is the nearest police station to where I live. Mm -hmm. And then go there and just report. The police know they are trained oh, on how to receive reports and what to do after I receive much. a report. Yeah. So Mananchi should not be worried that I might report and nothing will happen. Mm. Do the first step, mm. report. Um, but also go with good information. You know, uh, find out more before you. Maybe you it's run. been a week. This child has just been crying every yes. day. Yeah. Find out what is the name of the child, which mm. house number. You know, go with details to the police that will enable them to now move in mm. and to start investigation. Investigation mm. is not the work of manage. Your not. work is to report. So <laughs> yeah. don't worry. Somebody is going to expect you to investigate that yeah. case. So once you report to the police, they are trained on what to do. They know they are supposed to go to where. Uh, the allegation of the offense is uh, being committed and then they, they will do something about it. They will either rescue the child, yeah. uh, they will arrest who, uh, persons who they suspect to be perpetrators, then conduct the investigations. Mm -hmm. And once the investigations have been conducted, then they bring the file to us as ODPP mm -hmm. to prosecute. Ah. So let me ask you, um, just from a very commoner's point of view, mm -hmm. like we see in the movies, there are social services in Kenya. Yes. So they can take the child and put them in the system for protection. Yes. Oh. So that was the other institution I was going to talk ah, about. Okay. We have the Department of Children's Services in mm -hmm. Kenya. Mm -hmm. So this is a department of what you uh, yeah. call the social, social services, services yeah. basically. Yeah. And it is what it is, children's services. Mm -hmm. So they are they're in every sub-county. Mm -hmm. So if you go to, you know how uh, we have, uh, you know, placed our government offices, yes. you'll have the police station, the you'll have the chief, you'll have the county commissioner. Mm. There's, a, there's a children office in every location. Mm. So if you don't have to go to the police, maybe you feel you, the most important dire need is to have this child rescued. Mm. You can still go to the children office oh, okay. and report it's a certain child mm. who I believe is being abused or I have seen being yeah. abused. Mm. All right. Yeah. So they also know what to do. They will always come to the house, assess the situation. If they feel the child is in imminent danger, they will rescue they the, child the child immediately. Mm. When they rescue this child, they don't just go away with the child. They will call in the police. Mm. Right? So okay. the, these government offices always try to work hand in hand. Mm. So that even if you start at the police, they will bring in the children's services mm. for them to give shelter to the child and rescue the child. Mm. If you start at the children's services, they'll bring in the police mm. to be able to do the investigations. Mm. Uh, we also have the Mimbakumi nowadays ah, yeah. down at the grassroots. Yes, yes. Report to Mimbakumi. Most uh, Mimbakumi are vibrant. They know what to mm. do. They will bring in the chief or the county commissioner or the police. Mm. But at the end of the day, the most the two most important things are one that the child is removed from the toxic, dangerous environment, mm. which is what you really want because you do not want the abuse to continue to, to continue. a point yeah. where the child dies. Yes. And second, the perpetrators will be brought to book mm. because the police will not investigate the case. Bring to ODPP. And that's another point. Yes. So it has been investigated. Some few weeks back, we talked about DTC, decision to charge and case management. Mm -hmm. So now you have the file. Yes. Does it go through the same process? It will still go through the same process because we must be satisfied about the evidence that is available. Yeah. Does it meet the threshold? Is there uh, a, a reasonable prospect of getting a conviction. Mm. So we do ensure because we know there's no perfect system. Sometimes you might loop in somebody who's innocent, mm. but the evidence should be clear. Mm -hmm. So we, we, are, we are also very careful not to charge innocent people, but also yeah. careful that when we charge a suspect who indeed has committed the offense, they don't end up going scot-free at the end of the day because we missed something right at the beginning. That is the importance yeah. of decision, yeah. decision to charge. Yeah. But also let me add something. ODPP still has a stake. We might not be investigators, mm -hmm. but we are able, to, remember Article 157, the Constitution mm -hmm. gives the DPP mandate to be able to direct the yes. IG yes. to investigate any yes. matter. Yes. So you might report, but as a citizen, and you feel nothing is being done, 
So you can still write to us. And you can say, go to ODPP. You then can you come can directly to ah, us. Interesting, yeah. They write to us, tell yeah. us this, this case. Yeah. I reported nothing has happened. And we're able to direct the IG, take up this matter and, and have Investigate. investigations. Yes. And we oversee to ensure that the investigations are actually concluded. Because mm -hmm. yes. I think that's very important because I, we have... We have a certain relationship with the police. Yes. Sometimes people don't want to walk into the police's office or the chief. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they have a couple of times and they're not getting any help. Yeah. So it's important for us to know that we can write to the ODPP, then mm -hmm. they can order for investigations because yeah. it is within their mandate. Yeah. That's important. Thanks so much for that. Mm -hmm. So then there's something else we can discuss. Um, you said you have to make a decision whether to take a child into the system or not. Yeah. So what are the alternatives to prosecution? Because you get a case. What are the alternatives? All right. Yeah. And um, maybe be, let me begin by if there are cases in Kenya that deserve alternatives to prosecution are children cases. Mm. Basically, because of what we said about who is a child, yeah. really. Yeah. This is a young human being who is uh, still developing yes. psychologically, mentally. mentally. They yeah. are beginning to understand the world, they're beginning to understand their repercussions to action. Yeah. And yeah. If there's a group of people who are very amicable to change, Achieve. reform, mm. it's children. Mm. Because they're still young. Mm. You can mold their minds. So we, we really try at ODPP to find out which other way can we deal with this child apart from having to take them through the trial process. Because the trial process is a bit, uh, it's punitive, it's, it's difficult, yeah. it, it's uh, a bit harsh on anyone, mm. leave alone a child. Mm. So we, we recognize uh, um, certain ways, alternatives of dealing with a child. Mm -hmm. One of them is diversion, and the other one is plea bargaining. Plea bargaining. So diversion is when... Thank you. <laughs> what is diversion? <laughs> yeah, so diversion yeah. is when you decide uh, this person indeed has committed the offense, mm -hmm. and they have accepted responsibility mm -hmm. yes so you, that's the starting point we will we will not be able to give the aversion to somebody who says i'm innocent ah. we know we are talking about somebody who has accepted, accepted. responsibility mm. they say yes i'm the one who stole i'm the one mm. who did one two three i'm sorry about it so we take them away from the the just the criminal the system the trial the system. trial yeah they're in the system but they yes, will go through trial. but they will not go through trial. So we, we find other routes of dealing with them. And for children, we have quite a number of programs that mm -hmm. we can send them into, depending on how serious the offense is. Oh, so this is where community service comes in? Exactly. Oh. Community service, mm -hmm. you can have counseling service, ah. you can have drug rehabilitation services, you can have the child. If it's a very petty offense, mm -hmm. they took 1,000 from the auntie. You don't need the child to stop going that to cases? school. Yes, we do get. And, and, and that's why I say for every child that comes into the system, it is important that we stop and think, what is it? What happened? There's always a story yeah. back then. Yeah. Where is the child taking 1,000 and the aunties adamant I want this child in the system? Yeah. All right? Or even the parent. Mm. There could be some family breakdown happening, you know, pushing the child into, into crime. Yeah. Yeah. So th there are many ways of dealing with these children that, we can, that can help them to reform. Mm. Because remember, the purpose of the criminal justice system is one, to punish Okay. or to rehabil rehabilitate. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can achieve the rehabilitation mm -hmm. without having to go through the trial process, mm -hmm. you would rather take that option, especially for children. Yeah. And mm -hmm. are approved school part of diversion? Yes, they are. But unfortunately, for, for approved schools, you need to go through the, the system, system for them to, for them to, them to in. get into those ah, schools. Okay. All, right? All right. But we, we have other institutions. We At ODPP, we have been able to network and uh, get in like CSOs and NGOs that offer programs for rehabilitation. Charitable oh, organizations, organizations ah, okay. you know, or the non-governmental mm. organizations, mm. all right? Uh, like there's one we work with called Pendekezo Leto. They oh. have tailor-made programs mm -hmm. for diversion. Ah, okay. So we, we are able to bring them on board and then the cases go to them, they do the mm. rehabilitation and they give reports. We just don't mm -hmm. leave it at that mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we want to ensure we achieve mm. what it is we want to rehabilitate the child, to make them better. Yeah. 
right? So that is basically diversion, right? Yeah, yeah. So they just go into another system mm. that is being monitored yeah. by ODPP, or if the case had already gotten to court, it's done under the court mm. supervision. supervision. Okay. Oh, all right. And then we have plea bargaining. Yeah. So plea bargaining is where you enter into a conversation. Mm -hmm. That is what I would talk about, mm -hmm. a form of negotiation mm -hmm. with the other party, especially and only when you have sufficient evidence mm -hmm. against them. Mm -hmm. And you're telling them, we have sufficient evidence. If you go into trial, I am sure you will be convicted. But instead of using so much resources, and time for us to go through a trial to prove that you're guilty, we can come down and sit and talk about a sentence, propose a uh, sentence, which we can propose to the court. Mm -hmm. Remember, the court still has discretion at the end of the day on what's right. But mm -hmm. the courts are also alive to what plea bargaining is. Mm -hmm. And when they see a plea bargaining, they know it is important that we give a, a lenient sentence mm -hmm. on it. Sorry, Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, this one, but then involves going through the court because he has ah. to plead guilty, but then you get a lenient sentence out of it or even compensation mm. of the victim. It's it's quite an interesting system, mm. but it, it prevents that aspect of having to call witnesses, oh. the, the long adjournments mm. in court. So the, the case, it shortens the process. It shortens the process. Mm. Right. Ah, interesting. We've learned something today, the version, plea bargaining. And plea bargaining. A lot of things, rebut. <laughs> yes. But also, let me be clear, uh, for plea bargaining, we would not use it for sexual offences. Ah, okay. Yeah. Ah, okay, interesting. Yeah, I remember there was a case, I think, in one of the, in, in Northeastern, about some rape cases, but it was for adults. Yeah. And they had come to some agreement there that you are paid a fine, yeah. Yeah, some the local the arrangement matla, they the need. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so there's no plea bargain for sexual offences? No, it's uh, it's expressly prohibited by the law. Ah, okay, that's good to note. Yeah. Now, you st you hold, uh, part of your title is uh, anti-FGM. Yes. FGM is a big thing in this country. Mm -hmm. And there was a very interesting case this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this week. I was surprised that there are a doctor, a female doctor, mm -hmm. who has practiced for 31 years, wanted the court to decriminalize FGM. Mm -hmm. So maybe what I want to know from you is when was the anti-FGM form? Why was it put under the children's division? How long it's been operational? And what strides have you made? And before that, what do you think of this case? It was a win, right? It was a yes. good win for the anti-FGM crusaders. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so do I begin with the case or the back the case? The back case. Yeah. Okay, so the, the case is, you're right, you it's by it? a lady. Uh, yes, I was aware of it, mm -hmm. um, but there was our counsel, mm. uh, Mr. Obiri, who handled okay. the matter. All right. So uh, it was a petition that was filed by Dr. Tatum. Yes. Yeah, and um, what she was telling the court is there is need to overhaul the anti-FGM, the because prohibition. Of culture. Yeah, uh, because of culture, and she was saying it was impeding on the right to make a choice for a woman. Yeah. And it was also causing women to be unable to access a good medical uh, health care. Oh. Right? So she wanted it overhauled for those reasons. Um, there were a number of parties who were uh, enjoined yeah. mm. in this. Yeah. We had the government institutions, mm. uh, the anti-FGM board. She also wanted it to be declared uh, in an illegal board. Oh. Um, and then, so we, we had people who are interested parties, yeah. the NGO world. And I think it was, um, it, it might sound uh, um, questionable why would somebody do that, but I think sometimes it is important that we have people, you know, going out and talking about some of these issues for people to really appreciate. Yeah. Because uh, she raised those issues about uh, the right of a woman to make a decision about her body. Which was good. Yeah, which is an important conversation yeah. in the current world yeah. right now. Yeah. Uh, she also talked about uh, it was discriminatory. Mm -hmm. If men are doing circumcision, why, why? can't women yeah. uh, have this other one yeah. uh, performed? All right. Um, but, and the, at, the aspect of culture. Being Africans, we know how important culture, culture is, is yeah. to us. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, I have a right to exercise my culture. And somebody telling me not to exercise, my culture is imposing She's their culture. To the other things, yeah. Yes, on, on it. So, but the arguments of um, uh, 
the respondents who are the DPP, the AG, and the anti fgm mm -hmm. and the other interested parties were, were that it is a cultural practice, but it is That's harmful true. cultural it is. practice. Mm -hmm. uh, it has uh, negative consequences on the reproductive on the yeah. health of a woman. It, it is painful. Um, it has mental uh, repercussions, mm. uh, you know, women breaking down because one of the doctors who gave a testimony in that case said the women get the feeling of incompleteness. There's a part of them that is missing. Mm. And very interestingly, in fact, one of the doctors equated FGM to cutting off the tip of a penis. Oh. In other words, it is extremely retrogressive. Mm. So the, the, we had victims coming forward and said, I have gone through the FGM, FGM and these are the repercussions I have had to face. Mm -hmm. Some of them talk about suicidal feelings. You know, they were forced in into it, the yeah. inadequacy. Uh, then there's the, you know, the social pressure around it. Mm -hmm. We had witnesses talking about a runaway in, mm -hmm. in order not to be cut. Mm -hmm. But when I came back, I'm an adult, but I'm considered a child. By the community because you're not cut because you're not cut and so the court uh, in its conclusion holistically looked at the case and said the repercussions the negative outcomes of FGM, FGM far outweigh any benefit that is visible it mm. is if there is anyone any. yeah. so and if that is the case then whatever rights you have cannot be a right if it is harmful, harmful mm. right? Mm. And there was the issue of consent because mm. she was arguing, I'm an adult, I should be able to do what I want with my body. Mm. But the court was asking, and you know, the, the, the respondents and the parties were asking, but is it genuine consent when if you refuse to go through it, yeah, you're, you're ostracized by yeah, the community. Yeah, yeah you, you might even be forced. Some mm. of them, forced. some of the women during delivery are cut because the community really want them to go oh, through it. Yeah. And so the court was under the circumstances, we cannot say there was genuine consent. Mm. The, the consent given is not free and voluntary. And in fact, the court gave a very interesting uh, conclusion to it and mm. said that the women are actually like children. Mm. In this aspect, mm. they are as, are as vulnerable as a child because they cannot voice that they yeah, sent yeah. about Again, it. culture, where culture places women. Yes. Yeah. So the court upheld that the FGM is a harmful cultural practice. Yeah. The, the act is right. It is constitutional. Mm. It does not infringe on any right any rights. to it. Yeah. yeah. So then, how, why is it part of what you do at ODPP? Because it's a criminal offense. And remember, we do, we handle any criminal offense in yeah. Kenya and FGM well. is a criminal offense because it has been outlawed by a, um, an express law, mm -hmm. the Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation yes. Act, mm -hmm. which came into being in 2011. Mm -hmm. So we also have a specialized unit at the ODPP uh, for FGM matters. Mm. And so we deal with any case um, FGM. And um, they still have to be brought to you by the investigative agencies. Yeah, we still do the normal process of yeah. how we process our, our criminal matters. Mm -hmm. But the, the good thing about the unit is it's trained on how to prosecute ah, this uh, case. these cases yeah. because they're unique. Mm -hmm. This culture is not practiced everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we have equipped our prosecutors with uh, the skills on how to prosecute these cases. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, we even do community engagement activities around FGM. Because oh, yeah. remember, it's been there, a there culture. Are that are... Yeah. Yes, it's a mindset thing. So as you use the law on one side, you need to work on the mindset. So we also engage the community, yeah, have just dialogue. Just pull their thoughts about this practice. Uh, about this practice. Any, and has, me, any success in that? Do you get success in this? Yes, community yes. there is a lot of progress that yeah. has been made. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work being done by our office, mm -hmm. especially since the unit was formed. Mm -hmm. The anti-FGM has been, anti-FGM board has been very vibrant. We also get support from um, UNFPA. Mm. So they su support our activities. And we are seeing uh, there's progress. Mm. Uh, communities are beginning to slowly abandon mm. uh, this practice. And they are picking up some alternatives because FGM for some communities is a rite of passage. So if you're telling them this rite of passage uh, tell them is something else. harmful, yeah. Yeah, so what do they replace it with?
Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And even the, 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 the people, is it women who do it? It's also a form of employment for them. Exactly. <laughs> There's some economic aspect of yeah, it. Yeah. So they're giving, uh, and that's the good thing about when government institu institutions mm -hmm. are able to collaborate with mm -hmm. donor partners mm -hmm. and other civil society organizations and NGOs because you pool resources together. Yeah. So when we are prosecuting, the civil society is offering alternatives to the cutters, so they mm -hmm. abandon that practice. Mm -hmm. Um, the NGOs together with the law enforcement are talking to the community. It's illegal, you know, there's an act, stop it, yeah. you know, yeah. Good. So it's working quite well. Anti-FGM, interesting. Yeah. Ah, I think we can't close this show without talking about COVID. COVID yeah. happened. Yeah. A lot of things have happened. I had mm -hmm. their Romeo and Juliet parents. What is that past of world? <laughs> and of course, my concern is the lockdown mm -hmm. also brought out other issues. Family yeah. breakdowns, a lot of people sort of uh, got to understand themselves because we're in one space and mm -hmm. things happen, incest, rape in those spaces. So my question is, is it my imagination or have you, did you see a rise of cases during COVID? And then also, how have you been handling cases, children cases during COVID? Yeah, so you're, you're right. There, there was a rise of um, criminal cases and especially sexual cases, mm. sexual offenses and gender-based violence, you know. Mm. And the reason for this is now children are no longer going to school. school. So they are at home full time. And most adults are also not going far yeah. away from home. The ones who are used to traveling could no longer home. travel. Yeah. So everybody is in one space and true colors pop out, mm. right? So we had rise in cases of defilement because now the the how many hours do the kids spend in school? About six, seven, six hours, seven. Most of yeah. the days they're yeah. in school. Yeah. Now they're at home. So they're more accessible to the perpetrators, yeah. to the pedophiles. Yeah. Most right? of whom are normally, if it's if I'm right, family members, close family members. Close family members. Yeah. Yeah. From our experience, it's very hard to find a stranger who randomly just picks a child yeah. and defiles them or sexually uh, abuses them. Yeah. It is always somebody the child knows. It could be a relative, a father. Yeah. It could be a neighbor, but it is close Someone proximity. Close people they know. Yeah, so COVID made people <laughs> stay in one place. It squeezed it into, into one yes. place, yeah. And just created a very fertile ground for these offenses yeah. to happen. So there was, a, we noticed a spike mm -hmm. in, in those uh, offenses. Mm -hmm. So um, what what we have been trying to do as OBDPP, first of all, is to, to find out, and, and then also, you know, the, uh, the court scale down, mm -hmm. because now we could not have physical, physical yeah. uh, sessions. So we had to find a way, of course, together with our stakeholders, because this is not just about us. We are mm. to NCAJ. Mm. This is the the body uh, that is composed of stakeholders in the criminal justice system. Mm. Uh, we are talking about uh, judiciary, ODPP, the police, probation, the yeah. advocates mm. from the Law Society of Kenya. Uh, so there is that body charged with the mandate of coordinating issues, yeah. criminal. Mm. So they had to devise ways of how to continue dealing with it. So technology mm. is one of the things that mm. has been uptaken. Yeah. Right. So we are having virtual courts. Yeah. Life has changed. Life has really <laughs> changed. Everybody has had to go out of their comfort zone. Mm. Uh, but for children, one of the things we decided to do is to try and stop them from coming into the criminal justice mm -hmm. system. Because right now it's not the best time when everything is scaled down. So we've been doing a lot of diversion, um, a lot of diversion, a lot of bargaining. <laughs> yeah, now that you know that diversion yeah. is there, another way of another handling way the, the rehabilitating yeah. the child without taking them to court. Yeah. So th that's one of the things, especially ODPP and the police last week. Mm -hmm. So we have less children coming, coming into in, yeah. the criminal justice system. For the sexual offenses, we are prosecuting. We have not they stopped. Have to prosecute they have to be prosecuted. If you abuse a child, we will not allow you to go scot-free. Mm -hmm. So for those cases, they are still proceeding. All right. Yeah. So, uh, but this the courts have been trying to gradually take in more cases over time, mm -hmm. do more virtual sessions yeah. that not everything is grounded to, to a halt. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. COVID has really made things quite differently. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, you work with children. 
you you get to hear of heart wrenching stories. I think I'll be crying every day. They get overwhelming. I, you can't deny that. So mm. how do you deal with it as a person, as Mama Yao? <laughs> you carry the weight of the children, uh, the burden of the children of this country on your shoulders. They have to be safe. What do you do? It's it's um it's not an easy job. Yeah. It's not an easy job. Uh, I would not say we are rare. I would you know wish or the office would wish for for us to be but we are making progress it's not easy dealing with this i cases. think i'll cry every day <laughs> and that's what i did mm -hmm. the first few months of this work um i cried a lot i was i was a bit emotional in court so you, you know i could not really wrap my hand my head around okay. why would somebody do something so horrific to a child to a child yeah. as small as you hear of a child of two, two months years being defiled yeah. you know and you look at the child and they're confused it's it's heart-wrenching you know um there's somewhere one time i said i had almost quit and i actually thought about it because what happened is you also become paranoid in yeah. your personal life Space, yeah. so when you, you go back <laughs> home you don't want too many people around your children yeah. It, yeah. it's an effect you get out of work yeah. but once you discover why you need to be there mm. it becomes manageable it's purpose driven now. It, it becomes a balance mm. so you, you have the bad side of it where you have to deal with the horrid stories mm. and carry them in your head yeah it doesn't mean when you go to sleep you forget what happened in court today you can't detach yeah. you cannot detach but there's the therapeutic side of it um, which balances you as a prosecutor yeah of i made a change so this yeah. child is no longer being defiled mm. because That's they are out now. of that mm. environment mm. The perpetrator is not facing the law mm -hmm. and the chances that they will be punished for what they did mm -hmm. so that's a bit it's it's therapeutic so yeah. it's it's a balance that we deal with every day sometimes yeah. but it's hard to say you're emotional you don't have emotions about it you have to get it has to tug your heart yeah but the, that chance of being able to make a change for the child yeah. i think is what drives me every mm. day that's good yeah. interesting so uh, I bet in another in another life you'd be a pediatrician, then, eh? oh. <laughs> <laughs> or or a, or a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> I would go for the kindergarten. Initially, my dream was the pediatrician mm -hmm. one, um, but then um, I went to the hospital, and unfortunately, okay. my first visit to hospital, my mom was a nurse. Yeah. And I told her, where are the kids? I want to go where the kids are. And unfortunately, she took me to the cancer ward. Oh no. Yes. And you made your decision. <laughs> and the dream died that day. Can you imagine? Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I, I knew in my heart I would not be able to cope with the pain uh, of those children. Yeah. Yeah, so, and then God has his own miraculous ways. You're of, still working with children. Exactly. It's, yeah. um, it's, it's, uh, it, there are things that happen in your life mm -hmm. later that you realize, yeah. oh, this is the path That's I've been your... going down. You yeah. Know? So I found myself here and I have no regrets a lot uh, mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we are, apart from prosecution of cases, mm -hmm. we, are, we are also you know, working with the kids at committee YCTC okay. where we are running a mentorship program. So yes, so there are boys. children who are there with their mothers? No, at no, committee. Committee yeah. YCTC is a remand center for boys. Okay. Yeah, so these are boys who have been charged with criminal offenses. Oh. But we still believe children deserve a second chance. Yeah. So we are trying to mentor these boys to give them some life skills, mm. you know, um, try to get them away from that path of, of, of crime. crime. Yeah. So is there a similar facility for the girl child? Yes. Uh, we have uh, Kamai girls and Kirigiti girls. Oh, yes. like, like they're just institutions for reform? Yeah, they are remand centers and institutions ah. for, for reform. Okay. Because remember, we don't take children to jail. No, no, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. So I, I, I saw your Twitter handle and you're also an artist. So as we wind up this, tell us what kind of <laughs> artist are you? Touching. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's, I actually look uh, like an artist. <laughs> yeah, that's... Yeah. Oh, that, that's it, yeah. That's the that's uh, the, the other side of me. Though mm -hmm. I must admit, of late, I've not really pursued it, but mm -hmm. I draw and paint. So, oh, really? Yeah. Nice. So maybe oh. it will be my retirement plan. <laughs> you should, yeah. Yeah. Amma, you start a painting school for children. Actually, you're gonna end up you at one. <laughs> you never know. Life is um, life is big. Yeah. I'm trying to see our 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 Facebook post to see mm -hmm. if there's any question you can respond to. Mm -hmm. But this has been a very interesting talk. I, I bet even for me, I'm learning what diversion is and what 
plea bargaining is mm -hmm. and especially when it comes to children that is very interesting for us to know mm -hmm. oh my internet is not not bad yeah. maybe as look at it we can also talk about what the odpp is doing for yeah. for children mm -hmm. so we have been trying to create a safe space for children within the odpp prosecution mm -hmm. basically yes like creating a child-friendly system yeah and one of the ways we are we're doing that is by you know um like we have been rolling out white files for children cases so that anytime oh, as a prosecutor the now. color coding yeah. anytime you see a white file you know that's a child's mm. case and you need to give it priority yeah. because the idea is to get these children in and out of the system as quickly as possible mm. uh, we've also been doing separate registries and registers for children so mm. it's easy to retrieve these files and to also give them priority yeah uh, and maybe again you could speak about the right of mm -hmm. privacy for a child yeah yeah Yes, we've also developed some practice directions mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the rights to privacy of a child mm -hmm. and the right to legal representation. Mm -hmm. So right to privacy is we are saying even if a child is in the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. their, their identity needs to be concealed so yeah. that whatever they did when they were children does not follow them into mm -hmm. adulthood. And in ODP, we, for any chat sheet we approve, mm -hmm. it has to have the initials of the child mm -hmm. because chat sheets are more like public documents which are available and yeah. accessible to anyone. Yeah. So when you look at a chat sheet, we don't want you to know who the child is and what has happened to yeah. them. So we are protecting their privacy mm -hmm. as per the law. And then the right to legal representation, mm -hmm. you know, we realized as prosecution that um, oh, okay. not all children are have legal representation yeah. and conducting a trial with a child who is not legally represented that's an unfair mm -hmm. trial so the direction for also to get the prosecutors on what to do when mm -hmm. you go to court yeah. and you realize a child does not have mm -hmm. an advocate mm -hmm. a lawyer mm -hmm. what do you do from there mm -hmm. so we, we are trying to to just push the law mm -hmm. on legal aid so that okay. every child is represented mm -hmm. so that because they do not understand the court processes they yeah. need to have somebody to guide them mm -hmm. so that we we give them a, a fair, a fair chance. chance yeah yeah i'm seeing someone saying here one boy we wrote to say is color coding is fantastic mm -hmm. so it's a new thing it's not actually very new mm -hmm. um judiciary had already rolled it out they used the color white mm -hmm. So all the people we've also adop adopted that mm -hmm. and we're encouraging other agencies to also pick that color white, the police mm -hmm. and the others who deal with children so that we know in Kenya, like the way you have the yellow buses for school. Yes. In Still the criminal justice system, file. you see a white file, it's a, it's a child. If you are the magistrate, pull it up and start with it. Oh, Give it priority. Pick, yeah, priority. Yes. Interesting. So Mikal Black, if I get the name right, Michael Black says, children below 18 cannot give consent to sex, right? Exactly. But what happens when both are under 18? Okay. Yeah. When the girl gets pregnant. Oh, yeah, that's the question you had asked about Romy and Juliet. Yes, no, Romy and, Romy and Juliet case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Romy and, and Juliet case gets its name from uh, the Romy and Juliet story. Yeah. If people know about yeah. it, uh, the forbidden maybe, love. Maybe uh, Brayden doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it was a forbidden love yeah. story that uh, I think those ones who were born in the 70s or 60s well, no. did it as a set book. The 70s, but yeah. But it's a famous story about Romeo and Juliet and they were young and they fell in love yeah. and the families didn't want it. So it was a forbidden kind of love. Mm. It's the same scenario we have in Kenya. It's forbidden in the sense that if you're below the age of 18, you're not supposed to be engaging in sexual activity. Mm -hmm. Reality of the matter is it's happening. They do. Yes. Mm. So when they do that, it means they have committed offenses. Yeah. But it's both of them. And they say both of them were because it's they have committed a sexual offense, but there was no violence to it. It's just a girl and a boy. They were trying. They were young. They're in love. They like each other. They're yeah. experimenting. They don't understand the full repercussions, repercussions. of yeah. their act. These are not children you need to punish. These are okay. children you need to rehabilitate. But you know society punishes the girl more than the boy. Yeah, and that's what we are moving away. Yeah. We are moving away from. We are trying to have these children protected by the law, mm -hmm. but also rehabilitate in the process. There's no point of protecting if you cannot rehabilitate or yeah. redirect into the right direction. Yeah. So what we are doing with these cases, if, if there's no violence, and that is very important, there must be no violence or intimidation to the whole scenario. The both of them agreed, consent. No one pushed the other. And they're close in age. 
So we are not talking about a 17 year old and a 10 year, year old. Yeah. We are talking about a 17 year old and maybe a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So that closing age, upper age limit, yeah. um, we are classifying them as Romeo and Juliet cases and we are diverting. Remember what you talked about diversion. Yeah, diversion. We are taking them to another yeah. program where we can rehabilitate them. Mm. Yeah. So, so what happens to the boy? You just cancel them? So they, they, they can, well, counseling is one of the programs they can go through depending mm. on, you know, we will get social inquiry reports that will advise us on to why um, they're engaging in this activity yeah. so that we can be able to, diversion is about tailor making a suitable program for the person you're diverting. So we don't have a blanket yeah. a diversion program. Yeah. We must, what are the needs of the child mm -hmm. and what would best meet those needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay, quite interesting. So the child and is well protected. The child is well protected. Mm. And at this point, let me talk about, uh, remember, there was a um, high court, um, mm. there was a high court or court of appeal decision where the court had talked about the need to lower the age of consent. The consent yes. Because they were saying the boy child is suffering. <laughs> yes, I saw that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, the National Gender and Equality Commission was given the mandate by the ministry to develop um, like an opinion report to help the country to know which direction to go. Mm. Do we lower the age of consent How from 18? How was that even a discussion? Uh, yeah. <laughs> a national discussion. Yes. Yeah. And, and it was done and the, the report is out. Mm -hmm. And their the recommendations are we must retain the age of consent 18. to 18. Yeah, that's so important. let children go to school. Let, let children be, be children. Let them be children. Yeah. Uh, some of these things we are saying we want them to engage into in sex at 16. Yeah. How are they going to bring up child that comes out of that yeah. union? Yeah. They can't work because the law does not they allow anyone dependent. below the age of 18. Yes. Wow. So there is a lot with what about their education? Yeah. Our education system goes up to 17, 18. Yeah. So when you say the girl can have sex and engage in all these things at 16, what happens to education? What yeah. about her health? Yes. They're not bare. Doctors have they're stated not ready. biologically they're not ready to bear children. Actually, that discussion of just because a girl has started her period doesn't mean she's ready for, for sex. The physical maturity is not equivalent to mental maturity. They're two different health. things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so we are hoping that report will be adopted because I think that is the way to go. Let yeah. children be children. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, something else may be still of children. I know there are parents who take their children for family planning mm -hmm. when they begin their periods. Mm -hmm. Tell me that is wrong. <laughs> or that is okay. Uh, is it within their right to do so? We, we've been having discussions on other forums on that mm -hmm. and what is the law about that. And um, there's no express law saying you cannot take your child for family planning. That is the unfortunate thing. Uh -huh. But the consequences, the results of what you do mm -hmm. could actually arise into a criminal offense. Yes. Like, for example, if you take your child for family planning and then there are complications out of it, mm -hmm. you know, you could be easily charged with causing a child to be in need of care and mm -hmm. protection because you have brought some harm into their life. Mm -hmm. But maybe let me speak to the parents at this point. Yes. You, you don't need to do the family planning way to stop your child from getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. And when the report about the age of consent was being done, it was very holistic because the children were involved, parents were involved, the church was involved, yes. teachers and all mm -hmm. were also involved in that process. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that one of the reasons why children are even engaging in early sex mm -hmm. is because there is a problem in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, parents are not taking up their responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it is the first responsibility of training a child educating a child is the parent it's not yes. the teacher yeah so the parents need to start stepping up starts from home start with you talking to your children about what sex is and what are the various types of repercussions just don't tell them that if you have sex you'll have a baby that's, not, disease that's just as well. one yeah. of the repercussions yeah. this disease they could have sexual reproductive yeah. issues mm. there's the economic aspect of having a child that you cannot even bear you yeah. know, there's so much to it mm. So it's just to encourage parents, don't take the shorter route out of this. Mm -hmm. Just try your best. Sometimes mm -hmm. I know not every intervention works, yeah. but you must. You cannot start with giving um, 
uh, your child uh, contraceptive. <laughs> it doesn't help. It's it, a it shortcut. Does not, it is a shortcut. Yeah. There are diseases to it. There's HIV, which should not be re prevented. You can't by, reverse that. And you cannot reverse yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's a, case, there's a question here by Wamboy Miritu. Miritu. Sorry, Wamboy. She asks that how do you go about a case where the child totally refuses to testify if they have been defiled? They refuse. Kabisa. Yeah, that is actually one of the challenges we face as ODPP when mm. it comes to child witnessing. Mm. Um, and there are various reasons why a child will refuse to testify. Fear. Fear. Children are generally afraid of adults. Who are in court? It's the adults. The magistrate is an adult. The prosecutor is an adult. You put them there and they feel overwhelmed. They cannot speak. Secondly is the trauma from the, from the abuse. Yeah. It shuts them down. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it's because the first time the child is abused, they are told, if you dare talk about this, I'll hurt, so and so. I'll kill the child or I'll yeah. kill you. Mm. So there's, there's this trauma aspect to it and the child does not know how to address it. Okay. Um, the other one is direct intimidation. Yeah. Where the perpetrator is well known to the child and is telling the child, if you go to court and you say, I did it, you're dead. Mm. Uh, so there, there, there are many factors. So you're saying there's the extraneous factors yeah. where we have people intimidating the child or the courtroom environment or even the preparation to go to court is also another yeah. aspect we have discovered as prosecution is a challenge, but there's something we are doing about it. Um, we, we, in, we've been slowly training prosecutors on how to interview children because children are unique. Ah, yeah. How I'm talking to you, Anita, it's not the same way. It's not the same way I talk to a child. <laughs> it's specialized. Yes, it's yeah. specialized. Mm -hmm. I, I must first of all win over the trust of the child mm -hmm. for the child to be able to open up. So such kind of skills as skills that prosecutors need. Mm -hmm. So um, they are trained to do that. Yeah, we've been gradually training prosecutors. Mm. Um, it's a slow process, but there is something we are planning also to do like a massive rollout on child interviewing skills for for prosecutors. Yeah. Uh, we, we're also in the process of setting up some child-friendly interview rooms for mm -hmm. children. Yeah. So that the, the pre-trial is an effective process. Pre-trial is that process where the prosecutor prepares, prepares the yeah. child on how they will go to court, who they will meet in court, and what is expected of them in court. Mm. So when that process is done very well, you get a better child witness. Yeah. Right? Now, this other aspect of intimidation, we address it as prosecution. If we find out a child is not testifying because they have been intimidated, that is a criminal mm. offense. We'll bring in the police and the perpetrator will be rearrested. Mm. If, if the perpetrator, if the accused person is the one that is um, bringing on the intimidation, yeah. they will have a new criminal offense opened yes, against yeah. them yeah. and we will go for cancellation of bail terms, yeah. all right? Yeah. Well, so that uh, we, you stop the contact between the child and the accused person. Um, have there been incidences where a child refuses to testify totally and it tanks a case? It goes under totally. Yes, they have been. That's Unfortunately, sad. there have been cases like those. Either mm -hmm. they completely refuse mm -hmm. to testify or when mm -hmm. they go to the doc, mm -hmm. they will recant their statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it it's a challenge we face, but we try and address it at every level. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if a child recants their statement, they had written a statement and said, this is if what you happened, saw and yeah. saw and this is what they did to me, then they go to the doc, they say, it's not this person. We don't auto, we just don't declare the child a liar mm. because we understand who a child is and we know how vulnerable they are to the people around them, their circumstances and environment. Yeah. So this is a child we consider to be a vulnerable witness mm. and we'll use whatever mechanisms available to us in law. Mm. We could use a witness protection box that yeah. the child testifies without... Without seeing everyone else. Yeah, yeah. They're especially the accused person. Mm. You can use an intermediary. We have the witness protection program. You can send the child into the witness protection program. Uh, and and counseling and, yeah. you know, ways of restoring the, the mental um, rhythm of the child so that the child is, is not uh, so afraid to say who it is. Mm. And even investigations to find out why has the child in, you know, recanted. Because mm. if they did a statement and they identify the perpetrator, mm. what has changed? Mm. Who is it that has caused the change? Yeah. yeah. Tough job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but satisfying when you get the results you yeah. want, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question here by Tomika. 
Children in conflict with the law are supposed to be represented by counsel at the cost of the Republic. Mm. But it often is not the case because of lack of funds and pro bono advocates. How do you address these cases at ODPP? Uh, that is what I discussed uh, uh, a while back about what we are doing as ODPP. Yeah. We have done practice directions, advising the prosecutor on the steps to carry. But let me give, me a, uh, give you a background of how we got to that point. Mm -hmm. So what she's saying is true. Some children are not represented, yet we have a legal aid, a national legal aid service, which is supposed to provide. It's a government. It's a government oh, body yeah. with a statute. And it's supposed to have uh, finances and a, a pool of um, resources for the children or these other people who are not able to represent themselves to tap into. It's been a challenge to roll it out. So what we realize that ODPP is um, for any case where a child was unrepresented, mm -hmm. where we proceeded with the case and then went on to appeal where they went to the higher court and said, well, I think the trial was unfair because the child was, not was not represented. The court of uh, the, the appellate courts have been quashing all those decisions and we decided apart from the appellate court quashing those de decisions, it it's just reasonable and more of common sense that it would be unfair for a seasoned trained prosecutor to pit a case against a child who is not represented. Who is not represented. Mm. First of all, they do not even understand what the court is. Leave alone the system. Even what's happening. What is the, the even the procedure is a complex yeah. issue for them. Yeah. So what the DPP did mm. is he was able to engage the chief justice mm -hmm. and the attorney general because the, 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 that issue of legal aid falls with the Attorney General. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then the CJ is because the law says the court is supposed to ensure that this child is represented. represented. So they, the two have responsibility. What is the responsibility of ODPP? It's for us to bring to the attention of the court that the child I'm about to engage into a trial mm -hmm. is not represented. Mm -hmm. Can the court kindly make um, orders for them to get for the one. legal aid service to provide mm. the child with uh, legal representation. Can you as ODP call on legal aid directly? N not okay. We can, but it would be better we follow the protocols that it is the court yeah. that is supposed to issue an order, and the order served upon mm. um, the um, the AG or the legal aid service to yeah. provide this child yeah. um, with a representative. The CJ was very quick to act. Mm -hmm. As soon as the DPP wrote to him, he issued his own practice directions to his mm -hmm. magistrates mm -hmm. and told them to ensure that every, every child has a representative. A representative. Mm -hmm. So if there are issues of money, and there's, um, there's a Supreme Court ruling, and it says um, that the right to legal representation is not um, like a progressive right that yeah. should happen in small stages. Mm -hmm. It is immediate. It's immediate because yeah. the minute you go into a child with an unrepresented child, you have infringed on so many of their right. rights. So yeah. it must be accorded to them mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah. Then there's the pro bono scheme. I know at Milimani and I think Nakuru, it is working. Mm -hmm. So there's money from judiciary for the pro bono scheme. Mm -hmm. So advocates can take up these cases. They are given a small stipend mm -hmm. to enable them to to do these cases, yes, yes, yes. but it requires the, the court stations to form a committee so that they can be able to access the pro bono um, Service. uh, services. Oh. So yes. let me ask, as um, an underage, like a child in contact with the law, mm -hmm. am I able to walk into legal aid and say I need representation? That's one of the, you can actually access that. Of mm -hmm. course, a child would need to be accompanied by a guardian, yeah. but there's a procedure outlined in the in the Legal Aid Act mm -hmm. on how to access, so they can write to the Legal Aid uh, Services and request to be given um, a representative, yeah. a legal representative. For free? For free, at mm -hmm. the cost of the state, that mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Things we didn't know, legal aid exists. <laughs> Yeah, it <laughs> is, it, it's free. actually working in, in some counties, but not in all, yeah. which is the unfortunate thing. But uh, at least for ODPP, we've taken a stand that we will do our best not to proceed with a case where a child is not legal. But just for clarity, there are lawyers under legal aid, and they are paid by the government to do this. There, that's uh, that would be the pro bono one, mm -hmm. the pro bono scheme, yeah. where the court now you know enlists lawyers who can work for them under the pro bono scheme. Mm. 
but for the for the legal aid the court issues the order and then the legal aid service is supposed to provide mm. the advocate so there's no way they can say we have no staff we have no capacity to do this i understand that is one of the issues causing ah. the what you're seeing capacity. now the challenges capacity ah. issues ah. resources issues but again there's a supreme court ruling that says that is not immediate <laughs> it should be immediate yeah. yeah okay thanks that's in, that's interesting i hope you've been answered tamika uh, there's another question uh, first of all good job karimi i think you've been the best teacher on this child oh, matters today you. and like i promised uh, guys this is mama Yao, so she knows everything mm -hmm. about children and she represents them so veromas asks what is a structured way of supporting defiant children especially teens in secondary school these cases are becoming rampant and caregivers appear helpless parents are helpless mm -hmm. when it comes to their errant children they most mm -hmm. of them are in high school mm -hmm. so you hear a case of a child fighting the mother or you hear a child not actually mother but you hear many cases of children in schools beating up their teachers mm -hmm. so vero is asking how what what can we do about it mama yao <laughs> I might not have all the answers, yes. but what we are we are seeing from experience, uh, for a child to, to get to that point, there's a concussion of factors pushing the child to be that. And unfortunately, one of the factors we realize is there is lack of proper parenting currently. <laughs> it goes back home again. Yes, yeah. it's good for us to be realistic about these issues so that we know what the problem is and how to address it. We are busy parents, of course. The world has become a fast place. Different. We hardly have enough time. Yeah for our children, but out of that um, laxity, uh, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. our children are following, they, they're, they, they're the lacking yeah. uh, you know, a model mm. on, on what to follow. So mm. one of the things we need to do as a country is for you know, family strengthening. Um, of course, it's, it's not going to fall with us alone. It's many people coming together, the church coming together, yeah. the civil society coming together, we, we need to talk about what is proper parenting and how can parents uh, go about it to rein in their children. Because when a child lacks supervision, that is when you find a child went to a party. Yeah, got drunk. Got drunk and then uh, comes in the following day. The parent is there and they're telling you this has been happening for a while. And they but, help the child nurse the hangover first. Yes. <laughs> so how do you respond? What is your first response? Because your child learns a lot. Yeah. of how you respond yeah. so uh, family strengthening is one of the things we need to really work on mm -hmm. because even if you look at the children who have been charged with criminal offenses mm -hmm. most of them have issues with family mm -hmm. uh, issues mm -hmm. but also what we are talking about what is the role of mana inchi mm -hmm. in, a, in what is the responsibility of mana inchi when it comes to they have seen something wrong happening yeah okay fine i'm the parent i'm doing a poor job you are my neighbor. Yeah. What can you do about it? But then I think times have changed. Do, does the village still raise the child? That that, that is also the other thing. So we are t when we are talking about family strengthening because the family is breaking down, it means even the society it's itself. Like, yeah. there, there's a problem somewhere yeah. and, and people need to accept it and find a way of working about yeah. it. Yeah. But there's responsibility mm -hmm. of, you remember, okay, in my days, you are a bit younger. <laughs> Don't count on it. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, in my days, uh, you know, if a neighbor saw something off with me, they would either talk to yes. my parent yeah. or my auntie or anyone who would assist me. Or they meet out punishment then then. Or meet out punishment. Yeah. Or if they find you doing something wrong, they will not pass. They will help you. They will correct you. and correct you. Mm. So even law, so apart from the society doing that, even law enforcement needs to yeah. upscale, all right? Uh, needs to be more out there. I know it's a big challenge because now we have this these gadgets yes so the children are, are, are meeting yeah. on the social media platforms away from the knowledge of the parent so your child is in the house in the bedroom but they're not there with you mm. they're in another world mm. on the phones mm. so there's need to control also um a lot of this uh, a lot of this gadgets. From experience is there an age where you advise parents to give children to 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 give children their phones or i mean is there an age that i should not give my child a phone is there a limit all of experience not just the law i'm old school uh, uh, so i would not give. give my child a phone <laughs> yeah and the only reason i would not give my child a phone not because a phone is not a good thing there's a lot of good information yeah. there but it far outweighs what is the bad that is 
there and yeah. I'm not able to supervise. Mm. So anything I cannot supervise becomes a challenge because you will not it's know when things are going wrong. Mm. We have online child sexual exploitation, mm. a new area, emerging area of law, yeah. and it's blowing up. Mm. Children are being abused over the phones. Are you expanding into those areas as well as ODPP? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. We are. We have a small team dealing with um, working together with the DCI mm -hmm. uh, on this uh, online child sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of harm Going happening on. to children. Mm -hmm. These stories you're hearing of uh, a child wakes up in the morning and commits suicide, and the parent has no point. Cyberbullying. It's cyberbullying. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things happening there. There is sextortion. Yeah. The child is meeting a mzungu in Netherlands. You have no idea. And they're posing naked for them. Yes. Your child has eaten lunch. They have gone up <laughs> there. They have posed naked. The guy is Social black media is scary. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for me, a, a, a gadget I cannot supervise is a dangerous item. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so there's a question here from Carol Matz. I hope I get the name right. Mm -hmm. Lack of legal aid for children in conflict with the law results in delayed resolution of cases and likelihood of injustice. Do you have any message for young lawyers? How can they be of help? Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you seeing there's a lot of interest about uh, legal aid. Yes. And I, and I hope um, this message will get out to the legal aid, the AAG and the legal aid service. Yeah. Yes. Um, it has a lot of negative consequences, mm -hmm. but um, the message out there to the land, not just the young lawyers, to the lawyers, mm -hmm. give back. Yeah. Take a case. Do it for free. You know, don't expect much in return. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a pro bono scheme uh, near your court stations or the usual place of practice, join it. Join it. It, it may not give you much money, but you the impact you have you is you much have greater. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a call out. I, I know for Kenyans, we don't do a lot of pro bono work, mm. free work. You don't know what that is. Yeah. It's we about need the we money. Need, <laughs> yes. We, we need to, to be able, to, you don't need to do 10, 20 three cases, yeah. but at least take two, three cases per year yeah. and let it be the, what you're giving back to the society. Okay. So there is room for that. Courts, especially in the counties where we have very few defense advocates, it's, it's, it's a call for them to explore Just how they can, yeah. you know, help. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This has been great. Thank you so much for being an awesome, awesome guest. Like I promised, you had the information we needed. I hope you have been educated, the audience out there. There's still room to ask questions. There's room for us to respond to those questions as you may, as they arise. Thank you once again, and we hope that you join us again next week for the ODPP Cafe. Uh, remember, COVID is real. Mask up, social distance. Stay safe, keep yourself safe, safe, and also keep your neighbor safe or you're the person next to you. Thank you and have a very great weekend ahead.